All right, welcome to Under 40 CEOs Live, featuring Mr. Tonya Cole. Please do give yourselves a warm round of applause for making it down here on time. Thank you very much. You could have chosen to be anywhere else, but you chose to be here. My name is Fami Lucy Akimba Bajide. You may call me Fab. I'm the Executive Director for Africa at Under 40 CEOs. Now it is time to bring up to join me for a chat this gentleman who is an alumni of King's College Lagos, University of Lagos, and Harvard Business School. is the co-founder and former group executive director at Sahara Group, an energy conglomerate with operations spanning the entire energy chain in Nigeria and neighboring West African countries to East Africa and beyond. The group operates in 38 countries around the world with over 4,000 employees and an annual turnover of $11 billion. He was directly responsible for building the group's global expansion and upholding her corporate governance principles, maintaining her status with global institutions like the World Economic Forum, where he was a key member of Pact Against Corruption Initiative, the United Nations, where he was a pioneer member of the advisory board of the private sector advisory group for the UNDP Sustainable Development Group Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Mr. Tonya Cole. Now, uh, thank you very much for honoring us uh, with your presence at Under 40 CEOs Live, uh, Mr. Tonya Cole. You just helped us uh, break a record uh, by being the very first billionaire to grace the Under 40 <laughs> CEOs platform. Thank you very much. A round of applause for you. <laughs> I don't, I don't know about that, but it's fine. All right. So um, I recall many years ago um, when I first came to your office uh, to see you and asked to see Mr. Tony Echo. Uh, and I noticed that even though you were the CEO um, at the time, everyone, including the front desk, uh, would call you Tony. You know, and I was a bit thrown off, you know, not knowing how to address you. Because I know some call you Mr., but others even call you Pastor. Uh, you know, where I'm from, we do not uh, call our elders uh, by their first names, but uh, for the purpose of this interview, um, would you permit me to please call you Tonya? Please go ahead. So Tonya. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, <laughs> I just called a billionaire by his first name, by the way. Next up is Aliko. <laughs> All right, now, Tonya, um, you were born in 1967 in Port Harcourt, in the south southern state of um, uh, Nigeria, called River State. Please do share about your birth, parents, uh, and growing up in Port Harcourt. Hmm. So I was born, obviously, bang in the middle of the war um, in Port Harcourt. If I tell you I remember much about that, I'll just be lying to you. But there are one or two uh, slightly traumatic uh, things that stayed in memory. I remember a road trip, right? I remember a road trip where we were leaving Port Harcourt and we were going somewhere into Anambra State at the time. Um, I must have been less than somewhere between two and three years old. Uh, I asked much later that, did we have a road trip? And he said, yes, we did have a road trip. We were actually fleeing uh, Port Harcourt at the time. So I remember that. Um, I remember a bit of that episode uh, of the Civil War into late 1969 into 70. I was a little, little guy. But it tells me as we go through life that there are certain things that just stay in your memory because they make a, an impact in your spirit, in your soul. So a funny memory. Around about four years old, uh, sometime in 71, 72, I went to England. My father was at uh, Cambridge at the time, studying for his PhD. And so I went to England for a year, then came back after a year. Something always brings me back to Nigeria, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but I came back for about a year and then uh, went to Ibadan, lived in Ibadan for a year. So my first school was All Saints Church School in Ibadan. Mm -hmm. Lived a year there and then came back to Lagos, Corona, then King's College, and University of Lagos, and here I am now. 
All right, so growing up, uh, would you consider your family a middle class, upper middle class, or upper class family? You know, I've had, I've had one of those, well, I would say somewhere between middle class to upper middle class. Uh, but for me, strangely, I moved around and I did not live in my parents' house till I was 16. Okay, so I left my parents' house when I was six and I moved around from one place to another up until I was 15. When I left King's College and went to England to do my A-levels, that was the first time I actually began to live at home. By then, I think my character was formed and it was a bit too late to correct me, but so be it. But that's, that's what I remember about life. So it was, I had a different type of um, upbringing. It wouldn't be the type of upbringing that you would see, uh, people would say that you grew with your parents, mother, father, and all of that. My mom died when I was 11, so uh, I grew up uh, with aunties, stepmoms, all sorts of things. So it's, I, that was part of my foundation. It's part of what made me who I am today. The fact that I had to be independent very early. All right. So amongst all of those people that you lived with, your aunts, uh, family members, who had the most impact, who had the most influence in shaping uh, who you would eventually become? Um, hmm. That's interesting. I had, uh, I would say, so my late uncle uh, who kind of brought, so I was brought up from seven to 15, primarily uh, by the Graham Douglas family. Uh, so Napo Graham Douglas, who was the chief judge, uh, lawyer, it was in his home that I grew up. So my foundation would be traced into that family. And so who I am, I mean, we had some, we had some big fights in, in the house, but that is where my foundation is. And so I would always point back to that era as the foundation that made me who I am. All right, so tell me very quickly, uh, just a little bit more about your parents. What did they do for a living? So, uh, so my mom, that's my mom, not my stepmom. My mom was a writer, sportswoman, uh, one of those brilliant people who, I don't know, her gene kind of missed me, but, <laughs> but very, very brilliant. And so she wrote for, she was a journalist, uh, wrote for Sunday Times, worked a bit in Daily Times as well and was one of those people ahead of her time. Uh, she died of cancer when she, just before she was 38 or so at the time. Uh, my father has been a businessman, a journalist, a diplomat, all sorts of things, a uh, politician as well. Uh, my <coughs> earliest memories of him at the time was uh, when he was studying in school. And then he came back and was a civil servant at the uh, cabinet office. And then I remember the time he was MD of Daily Times and there was this whole story about this man that was being paid more than the president of Nigeria. And I remember that for at the time when he was in Daily Times. Then he left Daily Times and started as a businessman and thereafter uh, became uh, very involved in The Guardian, in uh, newspaper, journalism as well, and then politics. And for a long time, politics became the center of things happening in my house. And that's another story which I'm sure we'll get to. Of course, we'll definitely get there. <laughs> um, and I see you attended Corona School in Victoria Island and King's College as well. And I believe this was also part of the period that um, shaped um, your person. Um, and your foundation was effectively built. Uh, do you want to tell me more about that period? Uh, so again, uh, so Corona, from all saints, I came to Lagos and got into Corona. As a, as a child, you don't determine which school you go to. So I had no idea whether Corona was a good school, bad school, I just knew it was a school. Mm -hmm. uh, but Corona in itself probably gave me one of the uh, best foundations in terms of education that one can get. Um, I enjoyed my time in Corona. Again, I keep saying that probably because I was asserting my independence as a child very early, which meant that um, I used to get into trouble a lot. 
uh, I was trying to find myself, and I don't know, maybe it was because of the background, the homes that I, 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 was, I, uh, I lived in. But there are certain key uh, instances that happened uh, which taught me about making choices. Uh, my parents, both uh, foster parents and uh, my biological parents, would lead you to make life choices at times that are not natural for children. Mm. So I'll give you one. So I did my common entrance and I passed. I did quite well and I got to two of what you would call Nigeria's foremost uh, schools at the time. One was Igubi College and the other was King's College. Mm. I was 11 at the time. And so the results came in, I'd gotten into both schools. Now, as a, an 11 year old, the expectation is that your parents would say, oh, this is the school to go to. What did my parents do? They said I should choose which school, which of the schools to go. That was my choice to make. Now, that is extremely difficult for an 11 year old to do. But they allowed me, they said, look, they're both good schools, make your choice. Now, to make that choice, I had to go and ask people, what school, what about the school, which one should I, uh, which school should I take? Eventually, uh, I made the decision to go to King's College. And I think what my parents were trying to instill in me is that the consequence for your decisions are yours to hold. You make, don't come back and say, you asked me to do this. I didn't like this school because you said I should go there. So, um, so that was King's College. That was King's College uh, for me. And I believe it was the right decision at the end of the day. Webby College, great college as well. But King's College is very better. Sorry. <laughs> Floriet. <laughs> Floriet. <laughs> All right. So, um... Did you ever write that essay? You know, that one essay that uh, every English teacher seemed to want uh, everyone to write, my future ambition. Did you ever write it? <laughs> and what did you write if you did? Whether, we, if I wrote it, I don't remember writing it. Uh, what I kind of remember is that my, my aunt, uh, blessed memory now, one of the Mrs. Graham Douglas, she used to flog the living daylights out of me. <laughs> and why? She used to say, I have ants in my pants that I cannot sit in one place. I was always ready to go out, look for something out. I just was restless. I was just a restless soul. I needed to find something to do all the time. Just, if you wanted to punish me, even till today, just lock me up and say, sit down in one place for a long time. It, it becomes a problem. So that has been me. Now, um, but because, probably because I was always everywhere, uh, it made it a bit difficult for you to sit down and begin to look far into the future. You were more interested, uh, growing up as a teenager, in what can I do next, what's next, and all of that, what opportunities lie next, and that was how it came about. Incidentally, for some reason, I think I needed to get that out of my system early, mm. because round about turning 18 and getting into uh, University of Lagos, my thinking, my ability to think into the future changed. Prior to that, I was a good lucky, anything goes. I ended up doing architecture, for example. I'll, I'll give you an example on, um, on school. So, form three, you have to make decisions on which uh, courses to take. Most people already know when they're in form three that I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be this, these are the courses you have to take for work and all. For me, I selected courses that I liked. I had nothing to do with, you're going to be an engineer, this, that, that, yeah, okay, I like geography, I like English, I like fine arts, technical drawing, biology, I don't like physics, I don't like chemistry, so I'm not going to do it. And that's how I selected my courses. No advice, no one talking to me, no one directing me, nothing. 
I just selected courses I like. Then it got to jam, and I'm now filling my jam form, and I'm now looking for which subject, to do, which, <laughs> which uh, course in university, and my combinations were all over the place. If I looked at engineering, maybe I didn't do physics here. If I looked for this one, I didn't do that. So I'm sitting down and trying to select a course, and it's looking more and more likely that I'm going to end up either studying English or history or one of the uh, courses because I don't have combinations that will match. And I suddenly came upon architecture. And I was like, wow, OK, architecture, architecture, architecture. It matches. It fits. So I put architecture. That's how I ended up becoming an architect. Good story, right? Great story. <laughs> But there's something about God ordering the footsteps of a man. And believe me, architecture became something that I walked into. And for the first time in my life, I entered into something that was me. I just walked in and it just flowed. It was a program, a course that from the day I entered, I could excel in it. I remember I had a lecturer uh, who was kind of our guardian then, uh, Professor Ademi, and I didn't know at the time that my father had told him that he should just keep an eye on me because uh, I was quite a troublesome kid. <laughs> so <laughs> keep an eye on me and just make sure that I, um, I did well. Probably in my fourth year in university, he told my father not to worry that this one is doing okay, he's moving well. It had nothing to do with my character changing. It just had more to do with me finding myself in something that I was good at, purposeful, and I could plan. And it just changed how my life was. So I could still play, I could still party, I could still run around, but here I was doing something that was coming very easy to me. Mm. So I could excel and at the same time not change who I was. And it made a difference. All right, so I'm thinking about this. I mean, you have this freedom uh, from a very young age to choose. Um, I'm thinking, that, did this in any way affect how you have um, raised your children thus far? Do you give them the freedom to choose? I'm well aware um, that one of your children actually read fashion. Uh, I know a lot of parents are like, why are you going to the university to waste my money on fashion? Um, so, did you? Absolutely, because it's a benefit I've seen in my life, right? that it's not just the freedom to choose, but understanding that there's a consequence with every choice. You know, choosing is easy. People make choices every day. What is hard is that every choice has a consequence, and that consequence is yours to bear. So my choices that as a, as a growing up uh, child often led sometimes to being punished. But once I'd made up my mind that I was going to do this, I knew the consequence would come with punishment, and so I would make sure that I really enjoyed what I was doing, because the consequence means that I'll be punished <laughs> for it. <laughs> it kind of allowed me to weigh the trade-offs. Is the punish, can, you, can, you serve the, can you serve the time for the crime? Can you take the punishment for what you're about to do? Or in another way, can you enjoy the rewards for what you're doing. So with my children, very early I started telling them that, look, every choice has a consequence. So my training for them first was that understand the consequence to the choices. And then, unlike in my case where I was left to make the choices myself and then uh, corrected thereafter, I sat with them to discuss what their choices are to see if they understood the consequence, and if they understood the consequence of the choice that they were making, then they were free to take the choice. And so for education, where they went, schools, what subjects they wanted to study, and all of that, it was their choice at the end of the day. All right, amazing. So um, let's go back to University of Lagos. Um, you're this young 15, maybe 16-year-old boy. 17. 17 at the time. Um, you had got into architecture. You said, oh, you could party, play, but you enjoyed what you did. Uh, it's hard to reconcile this bubbly personality who is partying with this gentleman I'm seeing right now. And it's also hard to <laughs> reconcile it with, uh, you know, 
the typical architecture student who would sleep days and days in the studio, what, was that you? Yep, that was me plus more. Okay, so <laughs> that, that was me plus more. And um, so I'm sometimes, I'm sometimes, uh, my wife says I have, and my brother, they say I have uh, borderline OCD. I don't know if it's true, but. But what that means is that when you put your mind to something, you just do it. Uh, and so you have to, again, consequence and choice, you have to know that there are some things that if you start to do, the end result of that is dangerous. So as a result of that, even if you are with friends and they said, here, yeah, this is weed, smoke small, I didn't even touch it because I understood that if I started that line, I'm gone, I won't come back. So it's that kind of decision. So 16, I entered the University of Lagos, born again, total SU strong one. <laughs> <laughs> and that was me getting into university. And trust me, 17 years old, 18 years old, oh my goodness. You couldn't come, if I caught you that day, me and you, you must get born again. Now, 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 you're not going anywhere. <laughs> so that was my jam by years. Year one, year two. Very, very serious. As far as Christ was concerned, God, Jesus was coming tomorrow. I'm not aligned yet. He's coming tomorrow. You, are not, you must get born again. Let's start. But that was me. And I said, when I do things, I do it. But it also means I'm young at this point. And it also means that you can get very disappointed with certain things when you're doing that. And I got very disappointed. Um, it's a story for another day. But it kind of just made me do a 180. Uh, so one day I was like this, and the next day I just said, you know what? I'm like that. And when I moved, I moved. And so by year three in University of Lagos, at the end of year two, going into year three, I was now the club, foods club, party, girls, drinking, no drugs, but I was doing all of that. President of Foods Club three times. So when I do things, I do wow. things. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now Foods Club is a, it's a philanthropic social club. Okay, so please, yes. <laughs> let's. But that was that was me. So president of the club. But again, choices, consequence. So I knew that you can party, you can go to clubs, you can do all of that, but that there's a priority and there's school, okay? So, architecture is brutal, uh, very brutal. Um, there's one course that is six units. In one year, it's 12 units. Um, in the semester, in the entire year, I think I had 12 units, the total number of units of all the courses we had was probably 21. 20, no, 22 or 24, thereabouts. So one particular course called studio can take half the units of architecture. If you fail studio, you have an extra year immediately. There's no talking. You don't even begin to argue. The minute you failed, it's an extra year. And so people will get into architecture, and they will ask, how many years are you? It's your course. And they'll say 6 plus n, 6n, to the integer. And it meant that regularly you had people who were doing seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years, eleven years. And when you do twelve years, they just give you a degree and say you should go. You know, just go out if you've tried. But there were people like that. And so here I was in architecture, president of a club three times, partying, traveling. So I used to get up and just go to Ife. You remember? Pants in your hands, remember? So uh, I used to just move. So I'd go, go to Port Harcourt, go to Ife. I just love to travel. I love to explore. So I'd go, go wherever. One thing that most people did not realize, when it came to doing the work, I'd calculate my time. So there were two things that you needed to do. One, you needed to make attendance. And I did a calculation, mental calculation, that you had to be in school, you had to be in class 70% of the time. So 70% of the time I was in class. The other 30% was for 
enjoyment, just go wherever. And I also made a calculation that you had to pass studio. And for studio, it just meant that you will do 72 hours, once in, under pressure, sit down, no sleep, just do the work and hit it well. But remember, I said it came easy to me, and so I enjoyed it. But it also meant that I learned how to deliver under pressure. I learned how to stay awake for sometimes 72 hours, just three days, just stay in the studio and just push out the work. I learned how to do what I'm doing now, which is just to sit down and speak to people and deliver and just defend your work as if your life and my life depended on it. I knew the father I had. I could not, he, did, he used to intimidate us with certificates on his wall. First class this, first class that, PhD, and all of that. And I just go home and I'm like, gosh, <laughs> say first class everything, and I'm nowhere near first class. But I knew that he would not. He, my father never caned me, right? He never did. But if he was disappointed, it hits you far deeper. I learned how to accept a cane. But the disappointment of a parent because you failed or you did not do, you didn't live up to expectation was far more for me a driving force. Graduation day, six years later, graduation day, University of Lagos. Everybody is out there on graduation. Architecture is 6N. Many people are not graduating. A hundred people had come into my set of architecture, a hundred of us. I'm carrying a gown and I'm walking down and people are saying, you put that gown down, you cannot have graduated, it's not possible. <laughs> but six years I graduated. I finished architecture in six years. I got a merit in six years. I, there were, of the hundred of us, I think there were, if I remember right, 16, 16 of the original 100 that finished architecture in six years. Yeah, it was that bad. So it's possible for you to play, it's possible for you to enjoy life, but one thing that you must always do is know your choices and your consequence, and when you're doing it, know what's important. So I knew that I had to finish, and I graduated in six years, and that was it. Amazing. Good story, yeah? All right. <laughs> so it's on record. All right, thank you. Yeah, so it's on record um, that you were about 16 or 17 uh, when you met this beautiful young lady who would eventually become your <laughs> wife. Um, please do share. How did you meet? Okay, so um, let me see. So I had moved from the good Christian boy to this one that was now, uh, yeah, it kind of had one eye that could see. Anyway, so, um, so my wife had just come in as uh, I was in third year, and she had come in as a jambite studying medicine. And I remember that we had to then, as people, we had to shift people to parties. I don't know what it's called now, but whether it's shift, but that's what we used to call it in those days. So we take them to the parties and then we'll bring them back. And I remember it was a pool party at the time, and they were throwing people into the pool who couldn't swim and all of that. So as one of the reverse boys that knows how to, you know, you know <laughs> kind of water side people, so we kind of know how to swim. So, it's a danger, you know, teenagers do very foolish things, I'm sure we all know. So they'll just take someone and throw them in the pool. Can they swim? Can they not swim? It's their business. Just threw them in. And um, it kind of became my official duty, or an official duty to save people who were swimming. So they'll throw them into the pool and I'll go bring them out and, and all of that. I can't remember if they threw her into the pool, but I kind of decided I was going to teach her how to swim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we met, and um, and I guess the story we are still together many years after that after that lesson. So it must have been a good lesson. <laughs> <laughs> a very good one. All right. So um, we know you went to King's College. Uh, it's also on record somewhere that you went to King's School in the United Kingdom. 
Um, at what time was this? So that was, so after King's College, no one told me then that architecture that I had selected kind of had one of the very high jam scores. And so in my mind, kind of, it was like, you know what? Just jam was get 200 and above and you'll be okay. So I went to do jam and I probably got something like 230, 240, something like that, first year. And I didn't make it. Wow. I said, okay. So I ended up doing A levels in King's School, Ely. Now, I was now in England doing A levels. You know, everybody wants to run abroad at this. So there I was in bitter cold and all of that. And I remember one day, my mom, my, my stepmom now, so she fills my jam form for me, fills everything. Food architecture, University of Lagos. Then Jam used to have a center in, um, in England. So I've come for Easter. So I'm at Easter holiday, not thinking about school at all. I'm about to go back and she says, oh, uh, I filled Jam for you. You're going to do Jam again. I'm like, huh? Do Jam for what? I said, no, oh, just go and do it. Now I have no interest at all. I'm not even interested in coming back, nah, 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 it's not even in my plan. I'm now doing A-levels. So they fill the form, they give me the receipt. So I go to London, so I travel in, I can't remember the sequence now, but I have to do it before going back to school. So I get back after Easter, I walk into the hall, I do the, I just walk in, I'm not prepared, I haven't prepared, I haven't read, I haven't done anything. But as, you know, I said, God orders your footsteps. I'm doing A-levels now, and for some reason, I don't know what entered my head, truly I don't know, but for some reason I felt that I needed to do maths in A-level. I don't know why, but I'm doing maths in A-level now. Now, maths is not my strongest subject, but I'm kind of feeling that I'm tight, so I'm doing maths, and I'm really struggling, but I'm pushing myself. I have one Japanese guru in my room that maths is like second nature, so he's helping me. So I'm doing maths, I can't remember the other subjects, physics, no, not physics, maths, anyway. I'm doing some A-level subjects. So I walk into jam, right? I just take it. Now, I'm answering the questions without thinking. I'm just doing it, root. So I answer the questions. The ones I don't know, I don't shade. The ones I know, I answer. And then I get up, and probably before anybody is done, I finished, and I'm looking around and I'm saying, oh my God, I must be the dumbest person here. Because <laughs> <laughs> I finished, and I'm sitting down, and everybody's still writing. So I look over it again, I can't improve on what I've done, so I just said, look, I finished. And you know Nigerians, whether you're in Nigeria or you're in England, you're still Nigerian, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will do, do, get out of here. So, so I just get up, submit, and I leave. And I forget all about it. The next minute, I get a call. My father or mom, one of them comes and says, oh, your jam result is here, that you've passed and you've been accepted in the University of Lagos. And I'm like, what? How? And typical parents, you know what they ask me to do? You know? No one. Choose. <laughs> Again. So they said, okay, you've passed to University of Lagos Architecture. You are still in school doing A levels in King's School Lily. Choose. So I'm asking them, choose what? One is university, the other is A levels. What do you want me to do? They said, it's okay. Whatever you choose is fine. You want to go to university in Lagos? That's fine. You want to stay in England? It's okay. It's your choice. Make the choice. So I now have to choose between staying in England or coming to do architecture. Again, I have to go and talk to people. Because, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful lesson. It's, it's not something that you, you thrust easily on teenagers and all of that, but I had to choose. And my parents, they did not lift a finger to help. So I had to go back to school call my tutors in, uh, at King School, begin to talk to them, and try and get advice. University of Lagos, ask questions. And somehow I just said, you know what? I'll come back. 
something happened. One, I think what made that decision for me was my tutor in England said, you know, a university is not so much about the university, it's about the relationships and what you make of it. That is not so much about the, that the score is good, get a good score, but your life decisions are the relationships and the networks and what you make of that university. So whether you go to university in England or you go to university in Nigeria, it's not what is going to make you a person later on. It's who you meet and what you do with it. I think that's what changes. So when I heard that, I said, you know what, that's fine. And I came. That's amazing. Um, now, so you went from King's School, Unilag, and then you ended up in Brazil, in a university there. How did you, <laughs> how did you end up in Brazil? Oh, dear. <laughs> All right. So, University of Lagos, I told you about the play side. I also told you about the school side. But there was another part of University of Lagos which I didn't tell you, and that was the work part. And so, myself and my close, he, he kind of helped me because he was an ethical while I was the one I used to play. So he, one of my best friends in school, now, he is the typical, you know, the one that the parents love. Nine A stars, decided he was doing architecture from when he was like two years old, you know, that kind of thing. From primary school to secondary school to university, always top top, you know, that kind. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I didn't like those type of people, but that was him. And as providence, God or dream footsteps, whatever, we became roommates and we became best friends. And I just used to look at him and I said, what kind of a fickle boy is this? So I decided that I would teach him how to play. He decided that he would teach me how to walk. So together we became perfect partners. We started doing projects together, decided pairing us together. So we did competitions, we represented Nigeria in architecture in different places and so on and so forth. So we started, I mean, I owe him my life as far as becoming good in school. Because without him, I'm sure you will not even know me today. But he probably also owes me his life because I kind of opened his eyes so that he can have life. <laughs> <laughs> but together we made a perfect pair. And so what that meant was that because our architecture was good and our building models, so we used to build models, uh, model building was something I started with Lego and all of that, so I, I actually enjoyed it, and he enjoyed it, and we were very good at doing this. Now, to build a model, I said I'm not, uh, you know, I move around a lot. Model teaches you patience as well. You have to sit down and you have to be patient. It teaches you to be accurate. You have to be very, very detailed about your lines, everything just has to match. And so with model building, we used to build models for class, for our projects. Now, it wasn't necessary, but if you, you no, know, it was necessary, but you didn't have to do it to the level that we were doing it. So when we do it to the level we're doing it, everybody will come around and it will become the center of, you know, they're looking in, we're putting human beings inside, we just used to have fun with all of these things. And so people would come in and look at these things. Now, what that did was that the lecturers, our lecturers, decided that we're going to start working for them. Does that happen? So, they would have their private practice. They know that this model will sell the job. So, they will give us the drawings, and then we'll make models, and then we'll charge them. And then we, re we discovered that charging for models was, nobody had a price point. Because nobody was building, they didn't have machines building models, human beings, so it was intellectual property. So we could charge what, hey, we say, what? You can charge, Pew! we charged. Now they had to pay. So we're making crazy money from models. So all our holidays was on model building. So most of the large architectural firms in Lagos, Tauri Koka and so on and so forth, CG Dosheku and all, we started making models for them. So we're in school doing professional models for professional architects and charging professional fees. So we're in the money as well. 
<laughs> but with that, that brought us into business. Why is this important to Brazil? By the time we were leaving school, my mindset and his was that we didn't need to work for anyone. We already had our business. We were already drawing and doing architecture. We felt that we were the best architects that God had ever created, and that um, all the international architects, Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, INT, all of them, had nothing when it came to us. We were that ambitious that you will see our buildings all over the world. So my father calls me, we have graduated. I didn't tell him. As we were graduating, down in Yaba, we had paid for a building on Habad Macaulay. We had rented it, paid for it. We had registered a company, three of us. We were just going to become these great architects. We didn't know that life is not like that, but so be it. So we had paid. So my father says, OK, you finished, you graduated. So what next? What are your plans? And I'm sitting down, I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, I'm not working for anyone. I'm doing it. And he says, mm, OK. It's good to do your own business, but you know, it's actually better to learn that business is not all you think. It's better to learn using other people's money. And I'm like, what does that mean? He says, go and work for someone for five years. Learn how they make their decisions, the mistakes they make, blah, blah, blah. But know that you are studying that business because you want to open your own business. Now, I'm sitting and I'm saying, what does this man know? Me, I've been doing business. He doesn't know. I've set up my company. So I'm not listening. I just refuse to listen. So I finish. I'm stressed out from my project, tired, and I go to Brazil. So I'm, he's, he's ambassador in Brazil at this point. So I go to Brazil on holiday. So I'm telling, I told my partners, two of them here, that you know what, I'm going on holiday, I'm coming back, just wait. When I come back, everybody go and rest. When I come back, youth God and all of that. So I go to Brazil. I'm lying down by the pool. So we have a pool. Oh. <laughs> so I'm lying down by the pool. I'm just resting. You know, you're just coming down from this high. And this man walks up to me and says, hello. Brazilian man, are you, you know, he calls my name Tony, he says, are you Tony? I say, yep. He says, okay, um, my name is Fernando Teixeira. I say, okay. He says, you're starting work on Monday. I'm like, what? I said, no, 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 no. I said, where, who are you? He says, he's the architect that designed, that designed some things for Nigerian embassy, blah, blah, blah. He's just spoken to my father. My father must have been looking at me every day. I wake up, I lie, I say, this boy has no future ambition. <laughs> <laughs> There's this one, if I leave this one. So he tells him, he says, you know what? Go ahead, take this boy, let him go and walk. So he just comes and says, you're starting work on Monday. Now I'm thinking that no way. So I asked him, I said, what do you do? He tells me. I said, where is your office? He says, it's in another town. Ah, now remember I said I travel anyhow. I move. The minute he said, it's not in this town. It's another town that I've never been to. I said, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and so my mind was, you know what? It's a holiday job. I'm going there. I'll just go do something and I'm back. Two years. Whew. Yep, two years went. So that's Brazil for you. All right, so you speak Portuguese. Speak Portuguese. So I went, so once that decision was made, I kind of, so I, had, well, I then enrolled in the University of uh, Brasilia to do the foundation uh, Portuguese course so that I could, because now I'm working in a professional environment, it's important to learn some of the professional language, to know exactly how to write and read Portuguese. So I do the foundation course of Portuguese there. And then, yeah, I do speak Portuguese. All right, so at uh, what point uh, did, did those, uh, those ants in your pants uh, go to work again and you decided to move back to Nigeria? So, um, so my dad decides, I don't know why, but now that I'm 50, I kind of know why. But he kind of decides that he's going to run for president. And I'm like thinking, hmm. 
So he gets up, comes back to Nigeria. Uh, now, Nigeria at that time is bubbling on this whole military, democracy is coming back. And so for them, at the time, I think they must have been in their 40s, my parents then. So they must have been in their 40s, and they kind of felt that they were responsible for birthing Nigeria. All they had known was military rule from, and they tasted a bit of democracy with Shagari. And so for the first time in a long time, the military was now deciding to go. And so all of them, uh, Chuba Okadibo himself, at, um, old Musa Yaradwa and co, who were all of that generation, decided that let them be key to this rebirth of democracy. And so he decided to run and came back to Nigeria. Now, I was in Brazil and I just felt that it was irresponsible of me for something so monumental to be happening to sit in Brazil. And so I decided that I was going to come back to Nigeria uh, to join the, uh, the movement. And so I did. My, my employer at the time couldn't understand it because like, if I do something, I do it. Okay, so I was doing architecture and I was doing it. And he saw, he knew that as far as an architect is concerned, this one here has potential. So he saw it. So he said to me that, you know what? You're going to Nigeria. Your job is waiting for you. Go and come back. I said, no problem, but I never went back. <laughs> but I came back to Nigeria for that political thing. And hmm, that led to another decision. But let me let you ask the next question. All right. So how old, how old were you at the time? I think I was 23, 24, maybe about 24, thereabouts. Okay. So do you recall the, the very first time you would ever have conversations uh, about what would eventually become the Sahara Group mm -hmm. uh, with your then girlfriend, uh, now wife? Uh, what was your earliest recollection and how did the conversation go? Hmm. <laughs> so I think when it came to, with Sylvia, the conversation with Sahara, for Sahara must have been something that would, if I didn't handle it properly, would probably have traumatized her. Because Sahara came as a result of a crisis in Nigeria. A company I was working for, which by this time, Sahara was not in the picture. By this time, anything that had to do with entrepreneurship and my dreams to become this big entrepreneur had packed it. Uh, by the time we were talking about Sahara, or Sahara coming about, I was probably one of the, oh man, as I'm talking about this, you actually become your father sometimes. Anyway, so <laughs> I was probably one of the highest paid Nigerians at the time as a teenager, because I remember, uh, sorry, as a, as a young adult, because I was being paid in dollars, I was being paid as an expatriate for a foreign company, a Brazilian company. My salary then, dollars was hard to get, where this time was a very restrictive economy, and so dollars was near impossible. So I was being Bank CEOs at that time, in terms of dollars to Naira. I had a driver, a car, uh, brand new, brand new Honda. Brand new. Driver, staff, secretary, office, corner office, and the hotel. A big title on my card, very, very big title. Director of operations, very big title. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big title on my card. I had an expense account. I could retire anything, take people to dinner, lunch, anywhere, any restaurant in Lagos, I'm retired, uh, could travel, all my travel was covered. So those were some of the perks. 
I was 25, hmm. thereabouts, 25, 26. So you can imagine that kind of life with that kind of money in Lagos back then. Oh, big man. I had to get all of these things out early, you know. My blood, it just had to, God had to remove it early. But that was me up until the riot. Hmm. And Nigeria just started burning. For anybody who is old enough to know it, it seemed as if there would be no Nigeria after that period. Everything just shut down. People were this. They were at. The company I was working for, which was a Brazilian engineering company that came about out of the work I was doing in Brazil at first, that come to Nigeria and needed somebody who spoke Portuguese and knew Nigeria, blah, 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 and so on, calls me one day and they just called me panicking. And they just said, the expatriates, take me, take us to the airport. So I put them in the car, they are burning all sorts of things all over the place, they are hiding in the car, we drive to the airport, they get to the airport, I put them on the flight, and they go. And then they call me when they get to Brazil, a few days later, or maybe after things have cooled down a bit, and they said, liquidate the company, they are not coming back. So one day I had a job that was everything, and the next minute, no work, I was out of work. And that's how Sahara came about. So for Sylvia, I think it would have been kind of a shock because you're moving from this place to a place where you are now starting a business. All your savings and everything is going to go into this business. You're not going to earn a salary. She ended up becoming, for at least two years, the one who paid for everything with her loose salary and, uh, and also, for men who don't respect their wives that are working, I'm sorry for you, you better cheat them well. She, she managed everything, so she paid for it, she ran the home and all of that while I was focusing on it. So the conversation was more a lifestyle thing. You know, it just, it happened. It was something that we were doing as we went on. I had to leave and go to Port Harcourt. Hmm. So I moved to Port Harcourt and she was in Lagos. Um, I had to stay in the office that we rented in Port Harcourt. So I couldn't afford to go and rent another house. Uh, so I carved one room out. So I was staying in one room upstairs and the rest of the place was upstairs. And that's where I lived. So I just lived in the room. My parlor, everything was inside my room and all of that cut down my food completely. Food intake was cut down to one meal a day, zero, zero, one. You know that combination? Mm. So cut it down. Uh, driving from every other week, or every week, kind of every other week, I would drive from Potaco to Lagos to come and see the family and then get, go back to Potaco. So it was a total life from an expense account where I was sitting at every restaurant to a bread and granite, granite and banana. How many Potaco people are here? You know the combination. Uh, banana and granite combination. Mm. To that, that was life. So everything changed. You just had to change your mindset completely. And that is where entrepreneurship started. For me, round two, 2.0. 2 I'd done the first one in university. This was now reality. I had a wife, I had a son, I had a house we were renting in Lagos, and I had to make it work. There was no going back. If that failed, I was done. Hmm. This is Under 40 CEOs.